And I'm going to give people a little bit because in the last like 30 seconds, we have almost doubled our number of participants. So I'm going to be a little slow on the start here. I will show us our outline. No, Hayes, the laptop didn't fully die, but the monitor died. The monitor fully died. Like I cannot get any image on the monitor at all. So I can't use the laptop in any functional sense. Um, so no, none, none of, yeah, totally gone. None, no images of me today for better or worse um, as we go through. And in fact, because I don't have my laptop, uh, I, my whole like recording of videos has kind of been thrown off for the week. So my first announcement for the day is uh, this week's going to be a little light for better or worse. I think for a lot of people, it will be for better. Um, but today is going to be relatively simple. And then I only have one recorded video for us for Wednesday ahead. Um, so this week shouldn't be too bad in terms of new content. It's really going to be pretty light because my whole, you know, online presence has been thrown off by my laptop monitor completely going black. Um, I'm not really sure why. Yeah, it is super frustrating. I am going to Sacramento tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning to try to get it figured out at the Apple store. But um, we'll see. I am still going to hold office hours this week. But you don't get to look at me through office hours. Uh, since I have no camera. I will still hold office hours this week, even though I do not have a camera. I will still hold office hours, even though I don't have a camera. Um, okay, what other questions do we have before we get started on what is bound to be a relatively shorter day? But hopefully it's shorter. I feel like I've kept you guys over 50 minutes for the last like five weeks in a row. Other questions or announcements? I have no monitor, so we don't get to see me. Uh, I mean, I have no camera, so we don't get to see me. I will hold office hours this week. Oh, and this is the last week for you all to um, file, to report, to fill out SETs, Student Evaluations of Teaching. Please go into Blackboard. Uh, there's some instructions up on Discord or at least an image on where to find the link on Blackboard for your student evaluations of teaching or last week's videos. Uh, week 13's Monday's videos have some recordings of how to find the student evaluations of teaching. Um, this semester has been an experiment for me because it's been ex an experiment for all of us. So if you get online to fill out the SETs because you haven't done it yet, uh, maybe I could like prompt you for like what I'd particularly like feedback about. Um, I like my idea of course notes. I don't like the idea of having the due date at the end of the semester. I thought that would be helpful for a lot of people, but it turns out it's been helpful for some and unhelpful for others. So if you can offer constructive and reasonable and polite feedback, uh, on the student evaluations about the course notes, what has worked for you and what has not worked for you would be super helpful. There's a question in the chat. I know you won't be here next year, but do you know if any classes are going to be in person with the math classes? So there's a question in the chat about how many math classes will be in person. So there's a few sides to that. One, nobody is sure what's gonna happen locally uh, Chico State, now that the CSU is trying to mandate full vaccinations for all persons on any CSU campus. Did y'all hear about the CSU mandate that uh, says all CSU students and employees will um, be required to have a COVID vaccination by the start of the fall semester? Did that come out to students or did that come out just to faculty? Okay, so at least one student got it. Okay, we got that email too, great. 
thank you all, I appreciate that. And Hayes, I'll get to your question next. Um, uh, okay, so we don't know what's happening locally on campus because of that mandate. So that's the first part of that, Jake. The second part is um, everybody at Chico State recognizes that math classes, though they don't necessarily need to be done in person, students are failing math classes at a much higher rate when they are done online. Uh, we are learning at Chico State. Chico State students are failing math classes at a much higher rate when done online. So there's a big push to get a lot of math classes back in person. Okay, that's the second page. The third page is everybody recognizes that freshmen and sophomores are failing at a much higher rate than other uh, seniorities of majors. So juniors and seniors are doing much better online than generally than our freshmen and sophomores. So there's a competing force against the math classes trying to move back to face to face that says freshmen and sophomore classes, no matter the discipline, should be put uh, in person. Right, engineering is pretty rough online, I bet. So much of that is hands-on, is tactile. Uh, so we don't know exactly what's gonna happen yet, Jake. I know as a department, we're pushing really hard for most of our classes to be face-to-face, -face, but we're getting pushback by some people who teach predominantly freshman and sophomore courses. And we're getting pushed back by some faculty in the math department. There are a few, not many, but a few who really prefer to teach online for their own personal reasons that we will not get into. Um, so that was an incredibly long answer, Jake, to the uh, answer of a lot of people are pushing for back to face-to-face -to -face classes. Uh, as much as possible, but it's not clear which of these three sides is going to work out. The CSU mandate, which would make most classes face-to-face, -face, as I understand it, uh, the math department wanting all classes back in face-to-face, -face, or the campus wanting many math classes face-to-face, -face, but mostly just for upper division students. Okay, there was one more question uh, I got in the chat but I didn't answer because I was on a page. Okay, if we already submitted them but didn't answer what I just asked for in student evaluations of teaching, do you want me to shoot you an email about it? Uh, an email, or if you don't feel comfortable writing me an email so that I know who you are, the Google form ask is a great way to give me anonymous feedback about uh, our course notes, the flexibility of them, which helps or hurts your workflow, or in general, anything about um, the course notes. Uh, so yeah, I would take an email happily, but if you would prefer to remain anonymous, I encourage you to use the uh, Google form ask that I've set up on my webpage. Professor, when is the last, um, this is Christian, um, I was wondering when are you gonna be available for office hours during dead week and um, finals week? I will be available for office hours all through dead week. Okay. I don't yet know what our final time is, even though we have no final exam. I don't know what our final time is for the final. Okay. I've heard some rumors, but I haven't gotten anything official from the campus yet. Um, and I will probably be available for any standard office hours that happen before our final exam, but not after. Oh, okay. Thank Does you. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank okay. you. Great, thanks, Christian. Uh, okay, one more message in the chat. I don't know if you know this, I probably don't, but has faculty heard anything about on-campus housing next year? No, um, I don't deal with freshmen that much, so I have heard nothing about um, on-campus housing next year. I finally had a short answer to a question. <laughs> Um, okay, anything else before we get started for the day? Doesn't sound like it. Okay, so 
So we're going to move on to conditional densities as a topic. Uh, this has a lot to do with conditional probabilities. So um, really at this point, all we're kind of doing is like putting pieces together. We've kind of already laid the foundation for some of these topics to come. So now we're all we're doing is like moving the pieces into the right places. Um, if you want a solid reference on conditional densities, go to our syllabus and look at the first book listed under the section textbook in our syllabus. Specifically from that first book, chapter two, section eight. Chapter two, section eight from the first textbook listed in our syllabus is my recommendation for written reference on this material. I do not, in this case, recommend the second textbook for this um, as your first endeavor into conditional densities. The second textbook is heavily mathematical compared to this first textbook. And it's so much so it's a little bit, um, well, it's certainly intimidating, but I don't think it helps you see the broader picture because the mathematics is so deep, it's a little bit harder to see through that. Um, so first textbook in the syllabus, chapter two, section eight, is a pretty good reference for the uh, topic conditional densities. I will try to point out through our 50 minutes right now, the differences in notation between what I will be using and what this book will be using. They're really not that much, but um, I think it'll help you to hear the differences. So let's dive into it. We're gonna talk about conditional densities and it's gonna come right from conditional probability so we will revisit conditional probability first. For sets A and B, the conditional probability of A given B is really just fancy notation with this pipe operator here that we can read as given or condition, conditional on. And it's really just fancy notation for the probability of A intersect B divided by the probability of, somebody help me out, what goes in the denominator? It's or, right? Union. No, it's not or, it's whatever's being conditioned on. So it's a little bit simpler than that. Ah, B. In fact, yeah, it's just B. So the thinking here is, If we have two sets, A and B, then really all this notation is supposed to mean is the ratio of the intersection, whatever this probability is here in the intersection, relative to the set B. I don't know if that picture is helpful. So it's the intersection relative to the set B. So the thinking goes like this. If we know B has already happened, given B has already happened, conditional on the information contained in B, what is the probability of A? How can we update information about A given knowledge about B? And so the ratio assumes that given our knowledge about B means we're already kind of in the space of B. We're already within the set of B. Now that we have knowledge that B has already happened, we are in the set of B. And since B is a smaller set than the sample space, 
we can use that information to update our understanding of the probability of A. If B has already happened, what's the probability that A will then also happen? A and B together relative to just the probability of B. Okay, so really the piece I wanna focus on here to connect us to conditional densities. Yeah, definitely, I'll say this as many more times as you guys like me to. Really what we're trying to do is say, if B has already happened, what is the probability of A? Given our knowledge that B has already happened, what is the probability that A will then also happen? Given that B has already happened, what is the probability that A then will also happen? And that's exactly what A and B means. A intersect B says that both A and B have taken place for whatever the things may be, like maybe observed some flips of a coin in such a way, relative to only probability of B. Jake, was that the part you wanted me to say again? Great. So really what I'm trying to focus on here is the interpretation that we get by this A given B part. Given that B has happened, what can we learn about A? What is the probability of A given B has already happened. What is the probability of A given B has already happened? Well, we can take this idea that B is in some sense informing the probability of A, and we can adapt it to densities. We can adapt this kind of A depends on B idea to densities. And that's exactly what happens for a conditional density. So we're going to start with a joint density. For random variables. X. And Y. And let. H of Y and g of x be marginal. Maybe I'll make that more explicit. I mean explicitly marginal densities. Okay, let me pause here and look in the chat. Uh, Nathaniel, that's a great question. Is A given B the same as B given A? No, it is not. A given B is not the same as B given A. That's a subtlety that not everyone can see immediately. But I did pick examples for last week's material that highlights that A given B is not the same as B given A but you do need to like look closely into some of those examples. I think the way you can see that, I'll just make a quick note here on this slide and then delete it, is that B given A has the same numerator, you are correct, but because what goes in the denominator is whatever's conditioned on, means we get a different denominator here. And because the denominator is different, the whole fraction will tend to be different. Okay, that was my answer to Nathaniel's question. Perfect. 
Um, there's one more in here. Uh, I think it would get flipped. So if A has happened, what's the problem? Oh, right. Hayes, you're just helping me address that question. Uh, and I think we are saying the same thing. I just could write it down because I can't. <laughs> okay. Uh, it sounds like we're good on that question. If I missed another question in the chat, please just say something or type it out again, and hopefully I'll see it this next time. For now, I'm going to move back to the definition of conditional density. So we have a joint density of two random variables, x and y. We have their joint density. And let's claim we also have their marginal densities. That is the marginal density for each random variable by itself after you have already integrated over the other variable. So that is, if you recall, to get the marginal density of y, you integrate the joint density with respect to x. One more time. In order to get the marginal density of y, you integrate, well, you take the expectation, but let's just say it in terms of continuous distributions, because it'll be easier, but you could similarly sum. You integrate the joint density in terms of x. If you want the marginal of y, you integrate the joint density in terms of x. You integrate the other because integrating the joint density over x will leave you with a function of y. So by a symmetric argument then, if you want the marginal with respect to x, then you would integrate the joint density over y. If you want the marginal with respect to x, you'd integrate the joint density with respect to y. By integrating over y, you will be left with only a function of x. Okay, so that was my recap on marginal densities. So here comes the notation that we saw before. This is the conditional density of x given y. So this is as if y has already taken on a value, how does that inform x? If y has already taken on some value and we know what that value is, how does that inform x? And I hope you will see that the definition looks very similar to conditional probability. So this is the conditional density of x on y. And hopefully you see now, based on Nathan's excellent question, the conditional density of y on x is also a thing. However, it is not necessarily equal to the conditional density of x on y. So hopefully these definitions here look very similar to the definitions of conditional probability. The same thing happens. Whatever's being conditioned on goes in the denominator. Whatever is being conditioned on goes in the denominator. And it's the joint distribution, the joint density in the numerator. So the idea we are working with here is if x has already happened and we know what value it takes on, how does that change the density of y? So we now have a density of y that depends on the value of x. The conditional density of y on x is literally a density of the variable y 
given some value of x. The conditional density of x on y is literally a density on the variable x conditioned on some value of y. So this notation is a little confusing at first because in this equation, whatever this is equal to, there are both x and y variables. However, one of them is held fixed. There are both x and y variables over here. However, we think of one of them as held fixed and the other is a free unbound variable. The marginal and conditional densities are not the same. One of them, the conditional density, is a density on x conditional on some value of y. However, the marginal on x has no y value in it at all. So here's where maybe the notation is a little poor and we should address the issues. In most of the world of statistics, all of these functions are called F. In most of the world of statistics, all of these functions are called F. I'm only using H and G to help you see that there's more than one function going on here. But I didn't want to start using a third and fourth letter for the conditional densities. So it's almost like you should think about the functions being dependent solely on the arguments. It's almost like the arguments are helping you see what the functions are based on. Correct, we use marginal densities, which has only a function of x or only a function of y. Marginal densities have only a function of one of the two variables. And we use those marginal densities down here in the denominators to help us find conditional densities. Conditional densities are only a function of the first argument. And the second argument we think of as being fixed. It is some value. Totally. It is some value, even if we don't yet know what value that is. Okay, so two examples, and hopefully that will help clear things up even more. Consider the joint density, 6x squared times y for x in 0 to 1, the interval 0 to 1, inclusive of both 0 and 1, and y in the interval 0 to 1. So let's get a little practice going here with our marginal densities and then conditional densities. And then I'm going to tie this all the way back to our definition of independent random variables. So let's just go in order. This isn't so bad. G of x is the integral of the joint density with respect to what? What should we integrate over in order to get just a function of x? Think of integration as like removing one of the variables. Which variable do we want to remove in order to get a function of just x? Perfect. Okay, so we're going to integrate with respect to y. And what are the bounds on y? Perfect. Okay. Do you all want me to give you 30 seconds to do this integration problem on your own? Great. OK. 
Okay, try out this integral on your own. I'll give you about another 30 seconds here. Integrate 6x squared times y with respect to y over the bounds 0 to 1. Nice, okay. So we're getting some good results here. I appreciate when everybody's kind of on the same page. That was the allotted time, so let's just complete it together. I'm going to integrate with respect to y, so 6x squared is basically just a constant. We got y squared over 2 from 0 to 1. So this is 3x squared minus 0. This is for x in 0 to 1. Fantastic. OK, I'm running out of room, so I'm going to move this one down here. Let's find the marginal of y with respect to x. So by definition, this is just the joint density divided by the marginal with respect to x. All right, so I'm not going to give us a minute to do this on our own because this one's just kind of plugging in pieces we already have. What goes in the numerator? Somebody just type it out or tell me. 6x squared y. Nice. And what goes in the denominator? Somebody else? Nice, thank you. Okay, so it turns out x's cancel. Six and three goes away. So this is just two y. Do we all agree? Okay, I do want to give you all like one more minute to find the marginal of y. I do want to give you all one more minute to find the marginal of y. This is like a, an impromptu. I'll give you guys like a minute and a half here. Find the marginal of y. So you got to integrate the joint density over what variable? What variable do you want to remove? to end with a function just of y. Good. Two y question mark. So we're starting to see some half confident, <laughs> half confident uh, similar answers. How about I wait for like one more person to confirm two y? Maxime, thank you. Indeed, the marginal of y is 2 times y. But notice, part 3, f of xy is equal to 6x squared y, which is equal to h of x times, oh, whoops, sorry, 
h of y times g of x. Two y times three x squared. Do we all agree? So they are independent. So look what actually happens here. Let me come back to this. If we just continue the string of equalities, the numerator can actually look like h of y times g of x divided by g of x. So Hayes, this example is for you because earlier you asked, are conditional densities the same as marginal densities? The general answer is no, unless they're independent. If they're independent, then you can break up the joint density in terms of the product of the marginals, in which case, you get the cancellation we see here. Okay. My second example goes to show that this does not always work out. So let me pause for a minute here and ask if there's any questions. Are we all okay with finding a marginal in terms of X? Going to wait for a few more yelps and the responses. Great. Thank you. Are we all okay with finding a conditional density? It's really just the joint divided by. Correct. Hayes, the next example will be based on dependence. So I'll give you the answer to part three already. <laughs> Are we all okay with finding the conditional density in this example? It's just the joint divided by the marginal of whatever is conditioned on. Nice. Thumbs up. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. In this case, because the joint density is a product of the marginals, which literally says they are independent random variables, in this case, the uh, conditional density of y is actually equal to the marginal of y, only because this is an example where the random variables x and y with densities h of y and g of x are independent. The next example is to show us that this will not always work out. So consider the density the joint density x plus y for x in the interval 0 to 1 and y also in the interval 0 to 1. I'll give you all a minute to find the marginal density of y. And I'm just going to let you try this on your own now. I'm not going to lead you into the answer. I'll give you a minute. Find the marginal density of y given this new joint density. Find the marginal of y by itself. No x. Nice. Starting to see some answers trickle in, getting some confirmation. Let's go for a nice, uh, let's call it a majority vote of three. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> nice. 
Okay, so let's just do this one quickly. It's not so bad. We're going to integrate the joint density x plus y with respect to x so that we're left with a function of y from 0 to 1. This is just going to be x squared over 2 plus xy from 0 to 1. This will be 1 half plus y. Okay, how about the conditional density of x given y? I'm going to give you all maybe two minutes on this one. No, wait, I'm just going to give you a minute on this one because it's mostly just a question about the definition. Hey, does your question have the right idea? But you have to be explicit that it's the marginal of y times the marginal of g equal to the joint density. If you had a marginal of y, which was just equal to y, and a marginal of x that was just equal to x, then the way you would type it out would be correct. But in general, the marginals will not be just x and y. They will be functions of y, what I've been calling h of y, and a function of g, which I've been a function of x, which I've been calling g of x. OK, so I was talking a little bit through this one, but hopefully it didn't throw us off too bad. So the conditional densities are always the joint divided by whatever's being conditioned on. So in this case, it's just x plus y over y plus one half. And this is, and now here's what I was trying to reference earlier. This looks like it's a function of both x and y. But in fact, it's just a function of x condition on some value for y. So the question is, for some value of y, this is the density of x after we have learned that y has already happened and it took on some value. So this is a density specifically for x in 0 to 1. And y is some fixed value. So you can imagine if y was equal to you know, 0.1, then you'd get some density for x. And if y was equal to 3 quarters, you'd get a different density for x. And if y was equal to 9 tenths, you get a different density for x. So literally, this is a density for x dependent on some value for y. This is literally a density for x given some value of y. As y changes, the entire density for x changes. So what we're starting to do here and what we're going to do for the rest of the class is show how to introduce more than one variable in the world of statistics. By introducing more than one variable in the world of statistics, we can answer some really cool questions about how does you know, something affect something else. OK, so last question before I let you all free a few minutes early. Are x and y independent? I hope you all see that the marginal with respect to y is just equal to 1 half y. And by symmetry, the marginal for x, g of x, is just going to be 1 half 
x. So the question is, does f of x y equal g of x times h of y? No. So these are dependent. You do not get that cancellation we saw earlier. It just doesn't work out like that because they are not independent. You cannot break up the joint in terms of a product of the marginals. Because you can't break up the joint in terms of a product of marginals, the random variables x with marginal density g of x and the random variable y with marginal density h of y are dependent. Okay, all, I only have one video for us for the rest of the week. It's going to be a video that walks you through one of those interactive notebooks for a third example of um, joint marginal and conditional densities. It's an interactive notebook, so I make plots in that one. And hopefully the plots help you see that for some fixed value of whatever is being conditioned on, the entire density of the other changes. If you need to get going, please do. That's the end of my lecture for the day. I will stick around uh, and answer some questions for a little bit after 10.50, but not too long. I'm gonna stop recording now.